Hello and welcome to Weapons and Warfare. For Straight Arrow News, I'm your host, Ryan Robertson. Just ahead on this week's episode, high on anyone's list of American military vulnerabilities is the loss or interruption of satellite communications. So what happens if that worst case scenario takes place? We visit with one DOD contractor working to provide an answer. And how do you make sure your stealth aircraft stays stealthy? Hear why one Ohio-based company thinks this piece of equipment is the must-have tool of the season in our Weapon of the Week. But first, here are some headlines you may have missed. The hard reality of the Navy's maintenance problems are starting to take shape, and it could put the U.S. in a bind. According to Navy Sea Systems Command, the aircraft carrier USS John C. Stennis is undergoing a refueling and complex overhaul, expected to last until at least 2026. That puts four of the U.S. Navy's 11 aircraft carriers out of service for the foreseeable future. Add to that the uncertain return to service for two amphibious assault ships. The USS Wasp and USS Bataan will undergo modernization, keeping them out of service until mid-2026. This is while the USS Essex is undergoing maintenance repairs and upgrades in San Diego. That's three of the Navy's seven Wasp-class amphibious assault ships. It all adds up to disrupted deployment plans in the Indo-Pacific, and is raising a host of concerns about readiness challenges within the Navy. The Biden administration outlined plans for the U.S. government to develop and use artificial intelligence to advance national security while managing its risks. A White House memo directed federal agencies to, quote, improve the security and diversity of chip supply chains with AI in mind. It also prioritizes the collection of information on other countries' operations against the U.S. AI sector and passing that intelligence along quickly to AI developers to help keep their products secure. In this age, in this world, the application of artificial intelligence will define the future. And our country must once again develop new capabilities, new tools, and as General Eisenhower said, new doctrine if we want to ensure that AI works for us, for our partners, for our interests, and for our values, and not against us. Sullivan added the effort intends to balance the need for fair competition and open markets while protecting privacy, human rights, and ensuring AI systems do not undercut U.S. national security. And in Japan, American Marines and soldiers partnered with their counterparts from the Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force to take turns firing high-mobility artillery rocket systems, aka HIMARS, and M270 multiple launch rocket systems. It was a chance for the troops to perform some fire missions during Exercise Keen Sword 25 at the Yasubetsu Training Area in Hokkaido, Japan. Keen Sword is a biennial joint and bilateral field training exercise involving U.S. military and Japanese self-defense force personnel. It's designed to increase readiness and interoperability while strengthening the U.S.-Japan alliance. Communication. We have three PAAs, uh, which are currently full. Ask the leaders of any successful operation, and they'll tell you communication is the key to making everything work. 11 Sierra November Victor. It's also why communication infrastructure is always one of the first targets in a conflict. If the enemy can affect your ability to communicate, they can affect your ability to fight. Shooters and spotters gotta talk. That's why having a robust communication system matters. To that end, early this year, the U.S. Air Force's Air Mobility Command inked a deal with persistent systems to make sure their airmen can stay in constant communication, no matter where they are, no matter the situation. From satellites to cell towers, it's easy to fall into the trap of assuming communication is a given. 
But what happens if those satellites are taken out? Or there are no cell towers? One answer is an ad hoc radio network. Ad hoc networks, or mobile ad hoc networks, are decentralized types of wireless networks that don't rely on pre-existing infrastructure. Instead, each node participates in routing by forwarding data to other nodes. They call it cloud networking. Where we're connecting space, uh, terrestrial, and all sorts of uh, other data links that are common throughout the Air Force or the full DOD, we're able to, to utilize those in ways that they were just built for single purpose, like the walkie-talkie. So now we can talk to jets that have radios that were made 30 years ago uh, as if they were right next to us and they're on the other side of the country. We can update their target packages uh, within seconds as opposed to waiting for minutes or even hours as they come into other communication architectures. Adrian Robenheimer, Persistent Systems VP of Business Capture, says creating that kind of mobile networking environment is one reason why Air Mobility Command inked a deal worth more than $5 million for more than 280 of their MQ-5 handheld radios and 10 integrated sector antennas. The critical technologies that we're providing are specific. Um, it's, it's not something that is just, uh, I would say, open and um, there's a lot of innovation that goes into it, you know, from the standpoint of what our company provides as a non-traditional contractor. So we're providing technology ahead of what the requirements are asking for, because that's what it's gonna take. Another reason the Air Force was willing to make a multi-million dollar deal, the service saw persistent systems work firsthand during the Valiant Shield 2024 exercise in the Indo-Pacific. Over 11 days, their wave relay and cloud relay networking enabled U.S. commanders operating from forward deployed and fixed operations centers all over the Pacific to test the Air Force's agile combat employment concept through the Manic Cloud High Mobility Radio. Translation, warfighters could talk to other warfighters no matter where or who they were. Everything in the kill chain uh, is reduced to seconds instead of minutes, and that gives them better situational awareness, better lethality, and better accuracy when working with partner nations. Persistent Systems plans to deliver the full complement of MQ-5 radios and integrated sector antennas to the Air Force in January. Serving you clarity through context, our mission at SAN is to deliver the news straight down the middle. We're different from mainstream media because we spotlight distorted headlines and show you how to do it too. Discover stories that right and left leaning outlets are choosing not to cover by using our Media Miss tool. Download the SAN app and turn on notifications to have straight facts delivered right to your phone or tablet and get straight facts anytime at san.com. Stealth. The word alone conjures images of legendary aircraft like the F-117 Nighthawk, the B-2 Spirit, the F-22 Raptor, and of course, the F-35 Lightning II. While those are all distinctly different platforms, one thing ties them all together. Geometry. These planes are stealth platforms because of their design. Every angle is about reducing their visibility to radar, and the slightest bend, dent, or change in structure can eliminate their tactical advantage, making them visible to would-be adversaries. And that's where our Weapon of the Week comes in. Meet the Razor. At first glance, it sort of looks like a robotic snowplow, and it might be hard to figure out what it does. But in the hands of a skilled operator, it could mean the difference between a mission's success or failure. What Razor does is it actually measures the radar cross-section of a platform. And what we, what we mean when we talk about radar cross-section is what do we actually look like to a threat radar? or What do we look like to a threat system? And so we want to always understand what that looks like for, you know, even for acceptance testing, maintenance, all of those sorts of things. So Resonant is one of the first systems out there available to go out and actually um, actually measure the signature of the platform uh, 
in the hangar without having to go to a special facility or special lab or anything like that to be able to do it. And when you say, it, you know, in the hangar, it just kind of like rolls around the plane? So we'll actually, we'll actually take shots, so specific shots. So maybe we want to look at uh, a, uh, a certain sector of the aircraft or a certain section of the aircraft. That's how we do it. So we'll go, and basically we use the uh, a positioning system on there so we can, we know where the shot is and where we want to make the shot. And so we will uh, scan and then scan the system with the LIDARs and figure out where we are relative to the outer mold line of the aircraft. And then the robot will actually move into place and get within you know, about a millimeter or so of where it needs to be. So we get almost perfect alignment onto the platform. And so what that leads to is incredible repeatability and traceability. So over time, you know you're measuring the exact same spot in the exact same area. So you can understand how things are changing on your platform over time. Razor is actually an acronym, meaning Resonant Adaptable Zonal Radar. It's essentially a standalone robot that takes a very precise look at every piece of the aircraft. The radar cross-section basically defines your detectability. So how soon are you going to be detected by an enemy threat system, so by an enemy radar. So this goes back to what we would call low observable stealth platforms, those sorts of things. And so what the radar cross-section is, is basically a measure of how soon you're going to get detected. And so what we want to be able to do is to know what that number is so we know where we're going to be seen. While it is a large piece of equipment, it's not so big that it can't travel to wherever maintenance crews are positioned. The whole idea between Razor is to keep aircraft mission capable. So we want to keep aircraft in the air and we want to make sure that they have, that we're putting the pilots in the best possible position to win in an unfair fight. And we want to be able to have them where they're not going to be detected or at least know where the detection is going to occur at so they can start planning their missions appropriately. It's an impressive piece of technology, so much so that the Resonant Sciences team at this year's Airspace and Cyber Conference was visited by Secretary of the Air Force, Frank Kendall, who wanted to see the Razor for himself. I think we've got 29 systems sold so far, so uh, we're starting, you're starting to see them out in the wild a little bit more so. Um, and uh, you know, we're hoping to continue to push these out there. We're constantly innovating with the system, constantly adding new capability to it, refining the processing. Um, so we're really at the tip of the iceberg with Razor. Time now for comms check and one of the very first weapons of the week we featured here at Weapons and Warfare were the new Army Rifle and Squad Automatic Weapons, the 6-hour XM7 and the XM250 Light Machine Gun. Both were selected to replace the M4, the M16, and the M249 Light Machine Gun. These next-generation weapons represent an end to the Army's decades-long search for a replacement to put in the hands of their close contact operators. SIG started a partial fielding of the XM7 last December with full fielding in April, along with the 250. Since then, they've started delivering 2,500 rifles and 250 saws a month. We recently caught up with Jason St. John, SIG's Director of Government Products, at this year's AUSA annual meeting in Washington, D.C., to get a progress report on the feedback they've received in the first few months of delivering on their contract with the Army. I think they're overwhelmingly positive. Um, I do think this natural to have any kind of criticism to change. I was a soldier for 22 years, so I know that there's a strong resistance to change. Um, you know, you're gonna look at it, you're gonna look at everyone loving the machine gun when it's five pounds lighter than what it's replacing and increasing its performance significantly more than a, uh, the 240. Um, when you get to the XM7, yes, that performance is there. It's probably not as understood, but when I give you a pound and a half heavier rifle, the first thing you're going to do is complain, why am I carrying a pound and a half rifle? So you're gonna see some weight complaints. Um, when you do understand the capability of what this gives you for that pound and a half um, uh, weight increase, it gives me an anti-material capability at the individual soldier level that didn't exist prior to the implementation of this weapons platform. So now at the individual, individual rifleman level and above, Every single soldier has the ability to, to defeat a quarter inch of uh, AR-500 steel out to 200 meters and sometimes beyond. It's a drastic increase in performance and capability. At the moment, only close contact troops are being issued the new weapons. But St. John says it's likely only a matter of time before the Army starts fielding them to more troops. 
Of course, we would love that, right, for obvious reasons. But I think that, I think that as time goes on, I think there's always a desire for commonality across an entire force. Because when you start showing people the performance of what high pressure, high velocity, high performance ammunition can do, you start dreaming on why I need it. And I think it's only inevitable that you're going to see those dreams be realized down the line. St. John went on to say Six Hour is continuing to test and develop the weapons as their production ramps up. In fact, before any shipment is accepted by the Army, SIG conducts thousands of test fires in every lot. The last one we did, we said, uh, it was either four or five with 6,000 rounds for each one, zero malfunctions. So that's exceptional. When we did the first article test, it was 20,000 rounds uh, through four or five of these XM7s, and we had one malfunction across 20,000 rounds. So they have an MRBS of 10,000 rounds. So every 10,000 rounds before our stoppage. According to the Army's fiscal 2025 budget request, the service has a long-term plan of buying more than 111,000 XM7s and more than 13,000 XM250s. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us this week on Weapons and Warfare. Please remember to like and subscribe to all of our social media feeds so you never miss a thing. Like we said earlier, communication is key. All right, so this episode will publish on November 6th, one day after the U.S. election. And while I'm no fortune teller, I'm betting we probably don't know who will be the next president of the United States. But here are a few things I do know. Over the last few months leading up to Election Day, the United States military, and specifically its leadership, were called into question. Not just their ability to command, but their devotion to country. Now on the whole, the men and women who lead the U.S. Armed Forces are some of the most dedicated, patriotic, and selfless individuals on the planet. There are plenty of opportunities for service members to land high-paying jobs after leaving the service. Believe me, I've met them. The Lockheeds, Boeings, and Andrels of the world love to hire veterans. But for those that stay in the military, who choose to stay in their life of service, their experience and knowledge should not be cast aside so easily. And if they push back on an idea floated by their commander-in-chief, there is likely a very good reason for that and should warrant further discussion. Like I said, this episode is publishing on November 6th. And at the time of this recording, I don't know who the president-elect is. Regardless, I say this to them. The leaders of our United States military are the best of the best. They are the envy of the world. They deserve your respect, as I'm sure you expect theirs in return. For the sake of our nation and the world, listen to their guidance. Use their counsel to aid in your decision making. Show the American people you are worthy of the mantle they've bestowed upon you. Because whether they voted for you or not, you are their president. For senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, and graphics artist Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson with Straight Arrow News, signing off. Thank <laughs> you.